This is Bill Farmer again. Welcome back to McMaster University course Computer Science 1JC3 Introduction to Computational Thinking. We'll continue with our topic of numbers and today we're going to be talking about floating point numbers. Floating point numbers are a way of representing a finite set of rational numbers. The basic idea is to represent these numbers using scientific notation. Uh, but we do the scientific notation in base 2. So you may remember you know, from previous classes if you were writing something in scientific notation in base 10 you might write it like this. And this is the mantissa, and this is the exponent, and this is the base. And notice that the point here comes after one digit, and the possible digits here are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, because we have base 10. So here we have base 2. And it's exactly the same form. Uh, notice that we can it can be negative or positive, and our mantis is of the form one point m times two to the e. Now we only have one choice for one. We're not allowed to have zero here, and since this is base two, there's only one other choice one. And so um, we represent a rational number using fixed point, the fixed point format, using a fixed number of bits. So for single precision floating point numbers, which are often just called floats, we have 32 bits. So it's 32 bits, one bit for the sign here, and 23 bits for the unsigned mantissa, and we don't need a bit for the one. We know this first, um, the first digit's gonna be one, so we don't need a bit for that, and that leaves eight bits, eight bits for the exponent. Okay, so that's, that's the basic way we represent uh, floating point numbers. Like I said, we do this in in uh, base 2. Now, if we were going to do it with the double format, it's exactly the same, but we use 64 bits. Now, it's very convenient to express, express floating point numbers in base 10. We can do this in Haskell, and they can be written as follows. In these cases, we can write them as as decimal numbers, or here we can write them as scientific notation in base 10. Actually, this isn't technically scientific notation because scientific notation, the point would be come right after 5. But we can represent them both ways. Now, uh, let me remind you of something. If we were going to represent the number one third as a decimal, it would be represented like this, where we would have an infinite number of threes. That's the decimal representation of one-third. So we cannot represent one-third as a decimal fraction in with a fixed number of digits, finite number of digits. We have the same problem in base two. If we take the number one-tenth, and we're going to represent that in base two, it looks like this. It's going to be 0 0.0000011, and so forth. So we cannot represent even a simple number as one-tenth in base 2 with a finite number of digits. Okay, so um, let's move on. So, so we have these floating point numbers, and I want to point out something. Notice that we can't represent zero this way. 
because the matissa always is going to be non-zero and since the matissa is non-zero we can't represent zero so there are some other numbers we can represent with floating point numbers and those are represented using certain values of the exponent those certain values of the exponents tell us that we have a special floating point number that's not represented in the normal format so we can do arithmetic with floating point numbers. We can add them and multiply them. Uh, but the basic idea is that if we add two floating point numbers, we will get a new number. And that new number may not be representable as a floating point number. So we choose a floating point number which is the best approximation. We choose the floating point number which is closest to the true value. And this can lead to uh, problems where there is no suitable um, floating point number, so we choose the best we can get. So in because we have a, a bit for plus or minus, we actually have two zero values. We have minus zero and positive zero. And these can be returned if our result is too close to zero to be represented. So let's say we had a number that's positive that we're making smaller and smaller. Let's say we're dividing by that number by 2 over and over again. As we're making that number smaller and smaller, we are going to be choosing floating point numbers approximate to that. And at some point, our number will be so small that there is no positive floating point number that is near it, and so our number will be approximated as zero. So you can see this is a little strange. This would be a process where a positive number is getting smaller and smaller, it's always staying positive, but because of using floating point arithmetic, it suddenly becomes zero, it's no longer positive. This is called underflow. Now, another kind of problem that can happen is we can be, let's say, multiplying a number by two over and over again. So the number is getting bigger and bigger, Every time we do the operation, we're going to get the floating point number that's closest to the true value. And eventually, we run out of floating point numbers because there's only a finite number of them because we have only a fixed number of bits. And so our number would be too big to represent by any floating point number. So we represent it by a special value called infinity. And this is what's called positive overflow. And you have the same thing is if I had a negative number and I multiplied it by 2 over and over again, I would get negative number, I would get smaller and smaller numbers. They would be bigger and bigger in absolute value, but smaller and smaller numbers. And eventually I run out of floating point numbers to represent the number I get. This is called negative overflow. And the value we get is a special value called minus infinity. Now another special value is NAN, stands for not a number. This is a value we get when the floating point arithmetic would naturally give a value of undefined. So for instance, if I, in Haskell, compute the square root of minus one, that is undefined, you're gonna get NAN. Okay, so these are special values of floating point numbers, and they are also um, the, fir the first four here, you can say, they result when we have certain kinds of overflow or underflow. O underflow and overflow basically means we've run out of floating point numbers and we have to produce special values. So we can do floating point arithmetic, but it is an approximation of real arithmetic. So floating point arithmetic is an approximation of using real numbers or even rational numbers. And because, it, because it's an approximation, you can get in situations where the error can be greatly multiplied and actually your result could be totally bogus. So you get a result that has nothing to do with the true result. And for this reason, using floating point arithmetic takes care. And one thing you should always realize is floating point arithmetic, you can't just do it 
without thinking. It has to be done carefully. If you're using floating point arithmetic in developing software, someone on your, your development team really must understand floating point arithmetic to avoid horrible mistakes that do that result from bogus results being produced. Now, the interesting thing is both addition and multiplication, as we know, is associative, just in case you've forgotten what associative is. Associative says if I'm adding up x plus y plus z, if I add it this way, that's equal to adding it the other way. That's the associative law for addition. We have also the associative law for multiplication. And it turns out that addition and multiplication are associative, but they're not associative with respect to floating point numbers. And that doesn't matter if we have 16 bits or 32 bits or 64 bits, no matter how many bits you would use for floating point numbers. OK, so I have a question here. I'll give you some time. Um, I'll give you some time to uh, take a look at this. And the question basically is, we have two expressions here, this one and this one. And they both involve floating point numbers. And the, the question is, uh, what are the values of these? And you have four choices. So I'm going to stop for a moment. You can turn off your video. Think about it. Give me, figure out what the answer is. OK, I'm back. So let's look at the let's look at the first one. The first one we're going to first add a floating point number with its negation. So this is going to be 0. If you add a number with its negation, you're going to get 0. The best approximation is it to 0 is 0. So we have 0 plus 1 and this is going to be 1.0. It's going to be the floating point number 1. Now, look at the second one. Here we're adding a number that's very, very small, super small number. And we're going to, uh, it's, a, it's a super small number. It's a very big number in terms of absolute value. So I'm going to add to it 1. Now that 1 is going to give me a number that's going to be very, very small. But it's so small, the best approximation is, is this number. So this, this is going to equal it's going to equal that. And this may seem strange, but think of it, this is a number that has very big absolute value, and this is a number that has a small absolute value. And the result is going to be just move a little bit away from this, but not far enough away from it to get a new floating point number. We'll have the same floating point number. So this, this, and this they equal zero. So this is the right number. So I hope this shows you that you got to be careful with floating point numbers. You get results that you may not expect. OK, so let's move on. We have another case study. And this is a very interesting case study. Concerns floating point numbers. So in 1991, during the Gulf War, now just as some background, the Gulf War happened because Saddam Hussein, who was the ruler of Iraq, he decided to annex Kuwait. So he just moved his soldiers in, took Kuwait. And the rest of the world uh, were outraged by this. The United States raised a coalition of countries. The, co the countries located in Saudi they moved military into Saudi Arabia. And then they forced uh, Iraq, well, they fought the Iraqi army and forced the Iraqis to retreat from Kuwait. And Kuwait was liberated. That's basically how the war worked. And there were American soldiers located in Saudi Arabia. And the Iraqis would shoot Scud missiles into Saudi Arabia 
to try to attack the American bases there. And these Scud missiles were shot down by a system called, a missile system called the Patriot Missile System. So the Iraqis would shoot a Scud missile and the Patriot Missile System would track it and shoot it down. Now, what was noticed was that um, sometimes the missiles, the Patriot missiles, would miss the Scud missiles and miss them by a wide amount. And I can remember when watching on television there was some professor, I think at MIT, who was showing video and said there's something wrong with the Patriot missile system. Here's video that's showing it's missing the Scud missile. Now, what was happening? The failure was due to an inaccurate calculation of time. So the idea was uh, that the software developers, they decided they'd keep track of time in one-tenths of seconds. So they, they would represent a one-tenth one of a second using 24 bits. But let me just remind you of something we already talked about. Right up here, we, in order to represent a tenth of a second in binary, we need an infinite number of bits to do it accurately. So if we're only using 24 bits, we're, we, we're inaccurate. And what happens is, after 100 hours, this error becomes, this error will become a third of a second. And in a, in a third of a second, a scud travels approximately a half kilometer. This means after 100 hours of your running your system, your time is off by a third of a second. There's no hope of ever hitting a scud missile. Now, it turned out that the technicians, the, uh, the soldiers who were using this system, they learned just by observation that they would hit the scud missiles if they had rebooted their system recently. So they started rebooting their system as much as possible. And this is because every time they rebooted it, you would go back to measuring time, starting from zero, and then the measurement would be much more accurate. If you want to see details about this, here's a link to it. But if you think about this, this is, this is pretty pretty disturbing. It means that the software developers did not understand that when they represented a tenth of a second using binary, it wasn't going to be an exact representation. And they didn't think ahead of time due to this inaccuracy that as, as the system was running, it would become, its, its, its uh, measurement of time would become more and more inaccurate. So once again, this shows that computing professionals must understand how numbers are represented on a computer. Okay, so I have another question. Um, this is a question involving uh, simulating the motion of a projectile. So, you know, if we, you know, from physics or calculus, if we had um, an axis in time here and an axis in height, and we had a projectile, it would, you would have something, we send it up in the air, it'd be something like this. It would get to its maximum height up here, and the tangent line at this point would have slope zero. That means the derivative of the function representing this motion curve would be zero, and this would be the point when the velocity was zero. So here you'd have positive velocity that, that eventually drops down to zero, and then it, then it becomes negative velocity, and it will be at that uh, velocity be wherever the slope is when it hits. Okay, so suppose we want to simulate this in Haskell, and we're going to use vy to represent the velocity in the y direction, the velocity going up, in other words, or going down. Um, and I'm going to write some code to do this. I want to, I want to check 
I want to, in my simulation, I want to check when we get to the maximum point. I'm going to do that by checking when the velocity is zero. So you have four choices. Which is the right one? I'm going to give, a, give you a moment. You can stop your video and think about it. Which is the right one? Okay, I'm back. Um, if we look at these three, they're all really similar. They all they all are going to check to see if the velocity is equal to zero. Now the problem with this is if we're doing this simulation, we're going to do it with floating point numbers. And it's very possible that the velocity will never be zero. It gets, you know, as the velocity is dropping, it's getting closer and closer to zero, it gets up here, and then suddenly it, it's so here it's a very small positive number, then suddenly it's going to be a very small negative number. It may never actually be zero. In fact, we would not expect it ever to be zero. It'd be very unlikely to be zero. So this is the right way to do it. Check to see if the absolute value is small. In this case, less than um, um, 2 to the negative 6 power. So. So this is an important, uh, important part of floating point arithmetic that we can't expect exact comparisons. So for instance, it's not reasonable to check if, if two values equal each other or if they don't equal each other. Uh, because we, we're, we're using just a finite set of numbers, they only approximate the real mathematics. Uh, so what we want to do in general is we want to check to see if, if, like if we're checking if x and y are equal, we really want to check something like this. We want to check that if their difference is less than some small number. So an example of this is if we have a function f, and we want to consider, we want to find the roots of it, of f. You might think the test is going to be like this, but we know this is not going to work um, because um, x may, the, we may never get to an x where when we apply f to it, we get exactly zero. So, so our f of x may become very, very small, but it may never be zero. And so for that reason, we want to uh, take f of x, take the absolute value, and check to see if it's less than epsilon. Epsilon is some small amount. And what that small amount depends on the context. Uh, so epsilon may be very, very small for some contexts. In other contexts, it can be bigger. OK, so the last thing I want to do is, and I don't think, We can't quite, I can't quite get to the bottom of the slide, but I will, uh, we'll be able to deal with that. So in Haskell, we have numeric types. These are types of values that represent number systems. The main ones are int. These are for 32-bit or 64-bit machine integers. Whichever one you have depends on the architecture of your computer. We have integer, which are going to be all integers. Float are going to be single precision floating point numbers, which are 32-bit. Double are double precision floating point numbers, which are 64-bit. And rational, which are all rational numbers. And then we have operations that are common to all of these. So we have this. And what you can't see on the screen because it's not showing is these operations. So these last two are for x exponentiation, and this is for division. All of these operations have the, have the same symbols for the different number systems. But that doesn't mean the operations are the same. So for instance, if you're going to divide two integers, you're going to get, so for instance, if I'm 
if I'm going to divide uh, two integers, that is going to be different than di dividing two floating point numbers because if you're dividing two integers, you're so if we divide two divide by three, uh, that's going to be integer division. You're going to get zero here. Wait, sorry, you're going to get zero. Or it depends. You could also give it one. It depends which way you round. Here you're going to get you're going to get um, zero point six six. So, so to repeat, in Haskell, we have a number of numeric types, but they share the same set of arithmetic operators. These operators have the same names, but what the operations do will be different depending of what kind of numbers you apply them to. Okay, uh, we're going to stop here. Um, thank you very much. See you next time.